Hi, I'm Deboki, and today I am going to be reviewing Bad Blood, Secrets and Lies in a Silicon Valley Startup by John Carreyrou. This book is part of my recent WOW, I've been getting really lucky and everything I've been reading has been amazing binge. Uh, and for this book in particular though, that was not a surprise. This is a book that for reasons I'll get into um, that will probably become pretty apparent, um, I went into it kind of really expecting to love it. Bad Blood is about Elizabeth Holmes and Theranos, which billed itself as this revolutionary company uh, that was going to come in and apply the wonders of Silicon Valley to medicine, only to be revealed later on by John Carreyrou, the author of this book, um, who's also a reporter at the Wall Street Journal, uh, to be a, a complete fraud. I think Theranos has a special place in the hearts of many of us who have worked in biotech related fields, but like in a hate way. So. I have a lot to say in this video that's not necessarily about the book itself. This video is probably going to end up being like part review and part me ranting a lot about Theranos, um, so it might kind of seem at first like I'm giving away what the whole story is. But what I hope I can convince you of by the end of this video is that no matter how long you've been stopped following the Theranos story for, if you've been following it for a while or if today this video is the first time you ever heard of them, no matter how much you know about Theranos, this book is is essential reading. I was someone who obsessively followed the Theranos saga for probably like three-ish years and there was still so much I didn't know about the story or that didn't fully sink in until I read this book. There's also a moment while reading Bad Blood that I had kind of like a weird personal revelation that kind of freaked me out uh, and that had me texting like 10 people at once but I'll get more to that later. Okay so let's start off with some background on Theranos. Theranos started on a promise that's both really simple and really amazing. They were going to build a machine that would be able to run a bunch of diagnostic tests off of one drop of blood. A lot of the tests that are currently available that look at your blood for diagnostics, whether it's you know the presence of a certain disease or just to measure the the amount of maybe say like a vitamin in your blood, uh, those tests require you know a not insignificant amount of blood, and that can suck, especially for people who have chronic illnesses or people who are afraid of needles. So there's a lot of research that goes into diagnostic tests, whether it's making them more accessible, making them more accurate, making them able to detect more diseases. I have quite a few friends who work in this area, and from my outsider perspective, it seems like a field that is both challenging and incredibly rewarding. So in comes Elizabeth Holmes, a 19-year-old at Stanford, working in a lab where she's managed to convince both her professor and the grad student that she's working for that she has developed the plans for something that's going to change everything. To be clear, she didn't have any reason to believe that her technology would work. I mean, she thought it should work, but one of the first lessons of biology is that the distance between it should work and it would work is a lot of tears. I worked in a lab with some really smart undergrads, some who with a few more years of lab experience I'd probably be working for, but I don't think any of them would be offended if I said that I'm not really interested in developing an untested idea from someone who's only had a year or two of lab experience. Somehow though, Elizabeth Holmes was able to make a strong enough case to both that professor and her grad student to basically get them to buy into her idea, and the validation and investment that she got from that Stanford professor ended up going a long way in convincing others that there's a real solid scientific foundation for what she was doing. Along with her much older and elusive boyfriend, Sunny Balwani, Holmes set up her Theranos in Silicon Valley, a location that would end up playing a large role in how she envisioned both herself as a leader and her company as a disruptor. She famously idolized Steve Jobs, even adopting his uniform of the black turtleneck, and much of her company's machine, which they decided to call the Edison, ended up having its design, like its outer aesthetics, um, inspired in part with Apple design in mind. The Edison was supposed to change everything about how we look inside of our bodies. It was going to make it faster, cheaper, less painful, and that promise attracted a lot of attention and a lot of investment. She, Theranos had elder statesmen like Henry Kissinger on their board. They had a deal with Theranos that made their technology kind of the, the central part of this whole new wellness initiative that was going to be available to customers at the pharmacy. Holmes, Holmes herself ended up valued at over like a billion dollars, I think, in Theranos stock. I first heard about Elizabeth Holmes a few years ago when I was co-chairing my department's first uh, st grad student run seminar series. We wanted to have someone from industry speak as part of this series and several students suggested her name in part I, I presume because you know she had been gaining kind of a lot of acclaim or, or just attention for her ideas. She never replied to our invitation which 
at the time was unsurprising given her prominence, but in retrospect, it also seems unsurprising given how often Holmes avoided an audience that had the experience and the knowledge to be critical of her work. As the hype around her grew, so did the low rumbling sense that something at Theranos wasn't right. They hadn't published any of their data in a credible peer-reviewed setting, and they were being enormously secretive about their work in a way that's just not done in science. And even in the flattering profiles that came out about her, she never really said anything that inspired more confidence, I think, in a lot of scientists. The most infamous example of this comes from her New Yorker profile, which is written by Ken Aletta, where when asked how her device performed, she said, quote, a chemistry is performed so that a chemical reaction occurs and generates a signal from the chemical interaction with the sample, which is translated into a result which is then reviewed by certified laboratory personnel. To translate meaningless garbage into slightly less meaningless garbage, all Holmes said was the machine does what the machine does and then someone comes in to see what the machine did. And this is someone people were trusting their blood samples with. The hype bubble finally burst when John Carreyrou published the first in a series of investigative articles in the Wall Street Journal, revealing that the Edison and Theranos was basically a lie. I mean, they existed, it could do what it was supposed to do, but barely. The Edison wasn't able to produce reliable results, but Holmes and Balmwani were more focused on getting their money than either saying, hey, this machine doesn't work, or taking the time to develop a better product. So instead, they basically ordered the machines and tests that were run at, you know, traditional diagnostic facilities, the kinds that they were supposed to be disrupting, and then had their employees run single drops of blood on those machines. Those machines aren't equipped to handle a single drop of blood. That's why the Edison was going to be so revolutionary. But Holmes and Balwani threatened and harassed employees who questioned this practice, threats that were backed up by the powerful legal team at their disposal. Remember, Theranos had big deals with places like Walgreens, and they were running tests on actual people's blood that was meant to give actual results. So people's lives were being dictated by the results of tests that they didn't know were basically meaningless. Carrie's reporting helped set off an onslaught of investigations and legal trouble for Theranos, and the story is still ongoing. So I was a little concerned about the timing of this book, and the news that there's also plans to make a movie out of it starring Jennifer Lawrence, because it just seemed like, you know, the story is still going on, it hasn't reached a conclusion. But I'm also really glad that he decided to publish this book now because there's so much in it that I'm like I I didn't know and that I I'm happy to know at this point and because the noise around this book has also helped like just make people more generally aware of their nose overall and I think there's such an important conversation to be had around it. Some of you might be like me and also be obsessed with the the dramatics around their nose. Some of you may have never heard of Theranos until today, and a lot of you are probably somewhere in between. Whichever camp you're in, I think you should read this book. Caribou's investigation into Theranos spans not only the company and its science, but the families and lives of uh, Elizabeth Holmes, her allies, and her adversaries, revealing not just the facts of the case, but the personalities that shaped it. The details of the individuals involved fleshes out the story so much more, providing context for how so much could be built out of so little. The portrait he paints of Elizabeth Holmes and Sunny Balwani are particularly compelling and important, especially if you're the kind of person who reads some about some kind of crime and wonders what kind of person does that? There's a reason so many people have come out of this book asking if Holmes is a sociopath. Carreyrou tells the story so well, both in terms of how he organizes the book overall um, and also how he narrates different events that take place. I'm not super familiar with medical diagnostics and I found his descriptions of the science to be pretty much delivered at exactly the right level. There's enough technical detail for you to understand the stakes and the issues, but there's not so much detail that it overwhelms or distracts you from the actual core of the story that's happening. This book almost reads like fiction because of how well he weaves together different characters and narratives, and I think this is both emblematic not just of strong reporting, but of just really deft and masterful nonfiction writing. Bad Blood was one of my most anticipated releases of the year, and I expected to enjoy it. Uh, I'm lover of dramatics and schadenfreude, especially when it's delivered in one easy to access place. But I think it was somewhere around when Karu talks, tells this whole story about a Holmes family friend turned enemy who also happened to be a former CIA agent who had once gotten revenge on someone. 
through a combination of international espionage and petty Ivy League alumni antics that I realized I was getting a bit more from this book than I had expected. And this book is filled with moments like that. Some are absurd, some are like sad. There's just this range of these details that bring the story to life in a way that I just didn't expect. And personally, there was a moment that was almost too much for me to handle. Um, so I had heard in like different articles and interviews that Elizabeth Holmes, she had this brother and uh, apparently he was this Duke frat boy and she hired him and some of his fratty friends um, to come work at their house, not because they were actually qualified, but because she trusted him, even though he didn't seem to inspire much confidence in the other employees there. When I heard that, I was like, oh, cool, that's weird. Like, she probably shouldn't have done that. And then I started reading this book and I saw my high school mentioned, which was weird. My high school was this small boarding school. It's not exactly like this place that comes up all the time. And it turned out that Elizabeth Holmes' dad went there and I was like, oh, wow, that's weird. But you know, that's kind of a coincidence. But then I read a few more pages and I saw that her brother went there I was like, what? Like, her brother went to the same school as me, and then I saw her brother's name, and then I like put started putting pieces together, and I was like, shit, I know him. Like, I like don't know him know him, like I don't think we ever talked to each other, I doubt he remembers me because he was a few years older than me, but we were at the same school at the same time, and I remember him. And as soon as all of those pieces started clicking together, I immediately started texting one of my friends from high school just like to check like, like, was that real? Like, did that really happen? Like, am I thinking of the right person? And then I began texting a bunch of my other Theranos obsessed friends because I was just like, how have I been following the story for so long and only just started realizing that I have this weird, strange connection to it. There are a lot of moments from this book that I think will really stick with readers. You know, some of them are those anecdotes about weird, like family friend slash enemy slash CIA agents, like those kinds of absurd details. And But the ones that stuck with me the most are the stories that Kara Roo tells about the whistleblowers and the consumers themselves who are impacted by these tests. As I mentioned earlier, Theranos was happy to use its powerful legal team to intimidate employees who wanted to come forward about the fraud that was being committed at the company, even pitting a grandfather against his grandson in a manner that just had my skin crawling. And with his stories about consumers whose lives were directly impacted by these tests, I think Kiraru is actually addressing a major limitation around sort of the standard reporting around Theranos that, that I've been reading. Most of these news stories are understandably dominated by the fraud itself, but it's easy to lose track of why that fraud matters. After all, what they gave was bad information. They didn't make a dangerous batch of drugs. Information is important, but it's abstract. And I think with the stories, Kiraru is making their impact so much much more concrete and getting to a necessary truth. Bad information makes for bad science and bad science makes for dangerous medicine. I feel like you should read this book. Even if I don't know you, I probably feel like you should read this book. Obviously, I'm emotionally attached to the idea of recognizing the work that scientists put into medical research. I'm also emotionally attached to being mad at people who take shortcuts and lie and who make it harder for consumers to make educated decisions about their health. But even if you haven't sacrificed half of your personality to the lab, this book will help put into perspective the kind of work it takes to make medical discovery possible. Just through the lens of what you shouldn't do. The Theranos saga is ongoing, but it's felt like one of the most formative events of my grad school career, along with maybe the presidential election. And obviously some of that is just, you know, the timing, but also because of what Theranos says about science. I feel like when Kara Roo's articles first started coming out, there was like a collective sigh of relief among a lot of academic scientists um, who'd kind of been expecting this result all along. Like for so long they had been shouting that the emperor doesn't have any clothes on and finally the emperor was just, well, exposed. Publishing scientific results is a long, exhausting process that involves sending your work out to other scientists who are going to tear it apart. Every scientist, I think, basically complains their way through this process but also understands the value of it. What Theranos did is not science. They may have started out that way and there may have been employees at Theranos who are trying to do, you know, good science, who are trying to follow acceptable scientific processes and actually analyze their data in a legitimate way. But the way that Holmes and Balwani 
but especially Holmes, decided to run the company just made it a place that was never going to produce good science. From encouraging bad experimental and analytical techniques to creating an environment that discouraged collaboration and criticism, nothing about Theranos promoted science as it should be done. What I think underlied a lot of scientists' frustrations with the hype around Theranos was that a lot of these problems were basically on display in the very secretiveness that Theranos was using to shield itself. Not putting up your work for peer review is not a good way to make scientists trust you, but Holmes got away with it for so long by acting as if her technology was so special that it was exempt. There's an aspect to the story that's very much rooted in the Silicon Valley-ness of it all, um, and it's that arrogance that's sort of attached to kind of how Theranos went about doing what it did. Creating an app and experimenting with biology are two very different things. Biology is slow and prone to acting unpredictably, and there's not a whole lot you can do about it except be open to mistakes and, you know, slow progress. It's easy to dismiss scientists who are ranting about how valuable the scientific process is as people who are, you know, adhering to this tradition that's just getting in the way of progress, but that misses the obvious. The scientific process has been integral to progress. Scientists make real positive change in the world all the time, and it's because they collaborate and they submit their work for, for further scrutiny. Maybe Maybe if Theranos had tried to do that, they could have accomplished something, well, more than nothing. Theranos is probably not the last of its kind. There are new biotech companies coming out all the time with a lot of hype and revolutionary promises around them. Hopefully, the legacy of Theranos and this book is that journalists and investors and consumers will become better at parsing through what those companies claim and what they've actually accomplished. I want to close this video with one last rant, even though I have probably, like, 10 more in me. When the revelations of Elizabeth Holmes's fraud first came out, there were a few feminist -y articles about why women shouldn't turn their back on Elizabeth Holmes. And I think as those details have come out more and more, and maybe more with like the publishing of this book, there's still some articles that ask the question, what does Elizabeth Holmes mean for women in science? Let's just get this out of the way. Elizabeth Holmes has jack shit to do with women in science. Things aren't necessarily great for women in STEM, but they're not so bleak that we need to turn to a Steve Jobs wannabe who put her greed over other people's well-being. Elizabeth Holmes is a failed scientist, a failed businesswoman, and a failed con woman. Maybe she'll become better out of all of this, and maybe she won't. There's enough women on this planet that I don't really need to rest my stakes with her. So, those are my thoughts about a lot of things. Read Bad Blood. If you have already, tell me your thoughts. If you've been following Theranos for a while, tell me your thoughts. If you have questions about anything that I ranted about today, feel free to ask them down below. And thank you guys for watching. Bye.